If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We'll start at verse 8. Let's we'll start at verse 5 so it'll make a little more sense. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Let's say that again. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For what reason? For the suffering of death. Say that one more time. He was made a little lower than the angels. For what reason? For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and to whom are all things. Man, I wish we had the time. And bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to the brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you. And again, the writer here in Hebrews, by the way, is quoting the ancient scriptures. I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I in the children whom God has given me. Verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the public reading of your word. I ask you, Father, anoint me to speak. I feel it's such an important word today. Help me to speak it the way you would have me to speak it. Help me to discern so that I may speak clearly. That's the oracles of God. I pray, Father, that the word will find a place in the hearts of your people to bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold increase in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God this morning. I've had several places this morning where I wanted to start or where I could start, and I don't know how much I'll get to in the sense of breaking through the Scriptures other than the way I quote them. But what I have been wrestling with is something that I've been wrestling with my entire life, and it's, I brought this up, but I now want to kind of break the Scriptures open so that as we talk this morning, we can have a little bit of a better understanding of who you are because of what Christ has done for you. I have found out that in my life there was an underlying fear that gripped my heart from the time I was a little child. It wasn't a fear that I was going to get beat up or anything in that nature, but there was a fear nonetheless that stuck his ugly head up and paralyzed me in fear when I was about 26 years of age, shortly after I had been married. The first time that you've heard me, those of you who have listened to me, has heard me talk about the panic attacks that I used to go under, and they consumed me, church. And when I talk about panic, I do not mean panic in the sense of having a panic attack that lasts a couple minutes, and then, you, you know, you kind of, it gets a little bit better, and then maybe you have another one in a couple weeks. But this was different. See, when this panic gripped my heart, it didn't let go. I didn't really get any release, much of any release at all for about eight months, and the release I got then was not, be, was not because I overcame the fear. Rather, the release I got then was because of the medications that the doctors put me on because of the fear. 
So for about eight months, I ended up going to different doctors trying to figure out what was wrong with me. EKGs attached to me. Thought I was having a heart attack one minute. Maybe I was having a stroke. I don't know, but I know that what I was afraid of was death. It was death itself that terrified me, but I didn't quite know it. I wasn't quite sure because I was still a young man. Before the panic attacks happened, I didn't see myself dying. I mean, I understand. I lived like a heathen before I came to Jesus, man. I should have been dead by any stretch of the measure. Man, I thought we were Dukes of Hazzard manifest. We were the incarnation of the Dukes of Hazzards in Darlington, Florida, out running cops and jumping dirt roads, everything you can think of. Good old boys just having fun. Be all you ever saw, been in trouble with the law since the day they were born. Y'all don't know that, do you? <laughs> But after I came to Jesus, or after I would say Jesus came to me, I was 21 years of age when I surrendered my life to the call to preach the gospel. We have, this man right here, we have very similar DNA because we both got, what would you say, initiated into the gospel through the same preacher. And I want to say something to you this morning that it is imperative that we learn who Jesus is. If we don't, we will never be free to serve Him. Okay, let me say it like this. You'll never truly follow Jesus in life if you're still scared to die for Him. Or let me say it a little more simply. If you're still afraid of death, you can never truly live for Him. And I have found that through my life that I was staring into the future void of what I am going to come face to face with eventually. And this is the reason why so many of us have held to the rapture happening in our lifetime. Because it's not about other people finding Jesus, but it is actually a very, um, what would I say, it's very selfish. Because, see, if we think in this way, we're thinking, well, I've had preachers come to me and say, well, brother, bless God, the Lord done told me that I wouldn't die before the rapture. Well, they're dead now. What happened? Either God was lying or they were. But the thing is, I don't think they're trying to lie, but listen, the mind is powerful and it can convince us of many things. You can convince yourself of something and you will fight tooth and nail over it and it may have nothing of the truth attached to it. Men have held out in this American doctrine, not of Jesus' return, but of this idea that we're getting out of here any moment because of the fear of death. First, probably the fear of persecution, the fear of going through anything, tribulation, going through anything, difficulties, going through anything, the loss of a loved one, going through anything, children acting like heathen, going through anything. We don't want to go through, so we would rather get out of here as quick as we can so that we don't have to worry about facing that final frontier that terrified me all my life until I was finally able to stick my finger in his face and recognize that Christ Jesus Jesus has already went before me. But this doesn't come because somebody tells you. It doesn't come to you because you read it in a book. It doesn't come to you because you have all this great knowledge. You can read. You can study. You can even hear in your head, believe. But it does not equate the peace of God which passeth all understanding that doesn't originate from the mind but originates from Him Himself who has taken up residence in your heart. And this is imperative for us to understand, church, because I'm telling you that if we're going to find the ability to conquer the enemies of Christ while we're living on this earth, we have to first face death itself and recognize what it is and what it is that Christ came to do in order to deal with this thing that is at the very fringes of every fear that every human being has, rather their small fears or large fears. The end of all fear is the fear of the unknown, the fear of having to come to an hour where you're going to look death in its face and you're going to have to see, is it going to be the void of nothingness, uh, the place of the unknown, the place of all fears consummated into one place in one point of your time in your chronology that you will stand at the point of death and there you're going to have to find out have you came to a place in your life before you got there where you have seen Christ liberate us from the spirit of death 
Because this is going to be the foundation of how you live every waking moment of your life. Let me give an example. Let's see what I can do here. All right, let's check these out right here. Let's try this. And let's try this over here. I don't drop these microphones on the floor. Let's look at it like this right here for a moment. Now, the Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. Is that correct? The wages of so sin, all sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. There is none that doeth right, no, not one. All our righteousness as our filthy menstrual rags is what the scriptures are teaching. So there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation at all. Now, we read here in the book of Hebrews that it was for a purpose that Jesus came into the earth. Now, I would in one day say that God has more than one purpose, but I, I want to refrain from that and say there's only one purpose of God, but that one purpose has many things attached to that purpose. For an example, Jesus comes to, re to reveal to us who the Father is because they did not recognize Him. Jesus would say, no man has seen God at any time but the Son of God Himself. No man knows God but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father, and he whoever the Son will reveal Him too. So you have no revelation of God outside of Jesus Christ. Anything else is ideas, speculations, and if you're not careful, absolute terror and fear of the unknown. I've had people here of recent contact me, one lady that um, was in our ministry years and years and years ago, got a hold of me recently and was afraid that she was going to hell because she was struggling with keeping all of the commandments that she reads in the Old Testament. She's terrified. Why? Because she doesn't yet know Jesus. I'm telling you what I'm telling you. And you can know Jesus at the point of the place where you repented of your sin. And now in your mind, you might have life insurance and fire insurance. So that when you stand before God on the day of judgment, you can hold up your paperwork. You've heard me say this. You're going to hear me say it again because it's a great analogy. It's that you can hold up your paperwork and say, see, this is the date that I signed my paperwork. I have life insurance. Let me into heaven. This is the day I signed my paperwork. I have fire insurance. Don't send me to hell. This is not what the scriptures teach us salvation is, church. The Bible teaches us emphatically that salvation, according to John's gospel, is to know God and to know Jesus Christ in whom he sent. Salvation is knowledge of God, true knowledge of God that perfects you, that transforms you, and that makes you become the person that God has intended you to be. And it's because it's not by might nor by power. In other words, it's not anything you can do. Well, see, on the spectrum of time, church, we find that according to the book of Hebrews, that men, all men, were held in bondage by the fear of death itself. All bondage is self-perseverance in one way or the other. All bondage can be traced to the ultimate bondage, which is death. This is why you heard me speak more recently that there in your life, in each one of your lives, there is a hierarchy of value. In other words, there is a way in which you structure what is most important to you in your life so that in this structuring of what is valuable, you seek to order your life under this structure so that you can try to do what's right to the best of your ability. And even in that church, though there is of a necessity to understand what that structure must be, that structure cannot be absent from the true revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Even to understand that the very testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that is the spirit prophesying about your future in Him because of the testimony of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago in the fullness of time. And it was in the fullness of time that Jesus enters into the earth as the Son 
of God, the only begotten of the Father, enters in to the womb of a virgin named Mary, and there he begins the God who upholds all things. As we read here in Hebrews, the God who is for all things and to whom all things belong. The God, according to Colossians, the same God who upholds the entire creation continually. The same God who created all things that are seen and all things that are not seen and now held into existence not by the power of the Father but by the power of the Son of God. It is the Father who creates through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is the same eternal Son of God that in the fullness of time, according to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Love being the operative word here. Do not mistake it. It is not arbitrary. In the hierarchy of the value of understanding who Christ Jesus is as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you must understand that here is God in the sense to think that this is your goal. The operative word is the love of God. And here is the opposite where sin ultimately takes you into a state of death and non-being. And you find yourself somewhere between the two in your life. You'll find yourself in different places in your journey and you're walking this thing out. The Bible says that you're doing your best to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And you'll find yourself one day closer to the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Other days you're going to find yourself slipping and you're going to find yourself going back towards the state of sin and death. So let's ask the question, what then is death? Because I know that we have a lot of ideas and we mistake death for hell. We mistake death for we mistake death for the lake of fire. We mistake death for places of torment, places of bondage. But death itself is not, watch this, death itself is not the state of hell. Death itself is the state of the non-being, the exodus out of the creation of God into nothingness. This is how the old world always saw this until revelation starts unfolding in the new covenant by the apostles who walked with Jesus, except for Paul who was one born in due time, who though although he did not walk with Christ in his earthly ministry, he saw him on the road of Damascus when he said, Lord, who are you? And there the Lord reveals his name, I am Jesus whom you persecute. You must understand then that it was the bondage of the fear of death that held man in bondage all of creation. And I'm not quite sure why I've wrestled with this since I was a kid. Perhaps it's because of the call of God on my life. I'm not completely sure on that, but I can tell you that when I was a little bitty thing, maybe four years old, three to four or five, I would have night terrors after night terrors, sometimes five, six days a week. I would wake up, and some of you have heard this, some of you have not, I would wake up in absolute torment, and it was as if there was absolutely no hope. I was a little bitty boy experiencing hopelessness and helplessness, absolute fear and chaos, absolute torment and void of all of these things that escape from the presence of God. It is the absolute opposite of the journey. So if we walk with God, we are keeping our eyes upon Him who, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross. We looking unto Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 12. Looking unto Him who, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. We're looking unto Him. But to look unto Him, then, church, means that we have to look unto the way that He walked, the truth truth in whom he is, the life that he promises, the way, the truth, the life. There is a way laid out for us, and the writers of the Gospels tell us that in order to know the way, we take up our cross and we follow after him. We take up our cross, and we, we follow him. How? We follow him in death, burial, resurrection. There is no resurrection of the dead unless there is first death. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15 that he uses the analogy of a seed. The seed being a representation of our earthy bodies and that which comes out of the seed as an analogy of the heavenly body or the resurrection body that we will receive. 
So one is sown in dishonor, but that which is sown in dishonor will be raised in glory, according to the scripture. One is sown a natural seed, then it is raised a what? Come on, a spiritual seed. So the glory of the natural is not the glory of the spiritual, but that which is in you is the DNA, if I can say that word. What is inside of you is the promise of who you will be when you stand before him on the other side of that great beyond, that place that we don't want to talk about, that place place that we want to ignore, that place that we do not want as a fraction in our minds. How do I know? Because I read it in a book. No, because I have lived this every day of my life. And I didn't want to face it, church. For a long time, I didn't know that's what it was I was trying to face. I didn't realize that the fear that had gripped my heart most of my life had everything to do with not knowing what was on the other side. And yet, though I believe and I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, I had the promise of salvation. But church, I had to come to a conclusion. The realization is that eternal life is not just a promise. It is a promise that is to be made known to you now. There is a promise that you can know Him who is eternal life. I am the resurrection and the life is what Jesus told Martha when Lazarus was dead and had been buried four days by this time. He stinketh God in the flesh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Let Him die and let Him go to the grave and let Him sit there four days to show us, church, that death is not the end and death is not going to have the final say in our lives or in anybody else's life. And sometimes we think that God could have done it. God could have kept that person from dying. But church, make no mistake about it. We have a sinful way of viewing what death is in the better new covenant that the Lord Jesus Christ cut with His own precious blood, binding us to that eternal covenant with the succeeding and precious promises. And, and that is not at the conclusion of the promise of eternal life that lays before us, but eternal life, that everlasting place, dwelling with Him forever and ever, must not begin on the other side of that void. It must begin in the present, in the here and the now, so that we have eyes, eyes of eagles, if you will, eyes that can peer beyond the years of your life that you'll be able to look and then into an instant you can see even at the moment of what we would call dying in this world that as we lay our lives down, we are promised that it is just the corn of wheat that falls to the ground and if it abides alone, it will remain alone but if it falls to the ground and dies, it will bring forth much fruit. Death is not the end. Death it's just the beginning for the sons and the daughters of God. And it is the fear that held men in bondage. It is the fear that's held me in bondage. It is the fear of death that's made me make decisions in my life that were self-preserving and absolutely anti-Christ in the ways of what God had called me to do. And the Bible says this. This is the testimony. That the testimony of those who have overcome, they overcome by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives even unto death. So Jesus will say, He who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. Oh, church, what are you finding today? Because I see a generation of a bunch of self-preserving people. A narcissistic generation. It's my way. It's me, me, me. It's what I want. And if you don't give it to me, by God, I'll go somewhere. Where some go where you want to go. Because ultimately, we're all going to stand before the judge will see the cross and I'm telling you church that it will be the day that we will step out of death and step into the marvelous life come on oh death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory death has been swallowed up in life I preach this because I've fought it. I've wrestled with the beast of Ephesus. I know what it's like to look into the void before it's my time and be absolutely terrified by the nothingness of what it presents itself to be. The place of non-existence. The by sea, the fire in my eyes this morning. The state of non-existence. The state of non-being. The state of what we would call eternal conscious torment. It is the place of non-existence. The place of anti-creation. It is the place where you are no longer who you are but you become that which you never wanted to be. 
It is looking into the eyes of the one who rose from the dead. It gives us the hope and it gives us the victory to understand that what faces us in the future has no power over us. What faces us in the future has already been trampled down by the Son of God. Lord Jesus, we don't know that Jesus is God by the way that he lived. We don't know Jesus is God by the way that he rose from the dead. We know Jesus is God by the way that he died. Let me explain that. The ancient church would teach you that it was through his death that he tramples down death once and for all. How? This was his mission. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. For this purpose, not another purpose, not a different purpose, not some purpose you think works better, but the purpose for the Son of God to be manifested in this earth was to deal with the problem of death itself. Oh, he had to deal with sin in order to deal with death. See, the purpose is this, is that Jesus comes into this earth. He's promised the kingdoms of this world. He's promised a lot of things. The enemy tries to give him whatever might would benefit him in the moment. What would benefit him in, in, in a momentary gratification. In a state of compromise, you can avoid the trials and tribulations of life. See, this is what I find so many of us do. I've heard preachers say, he suffered so we don't have to suffer. He died so we don't have to die. You're a Gnostic heretic and you need to sit down. You hear me use that word? Eventually you're going to look it up and find out what I'm talking about because it is rampant in the church. What is Gnosticism? It's dualism. It is us and them. It is one day, one day, one day. It is Christ here, me here. Not understanding that in the incarnation, do you know what that word means? The incarnation is when God becomes a human being. It's when God wraps himself in human flesh and he's 100% God and he's 100% man. There's no division, yet there's no separation. And there's the, the distinction is that God in the flesh has two wills, divine will, human will. He has divine nature and human nature. Why? Because if he was not God, he could not save us because only God can save us. And if he was not man, we could not be saved. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because it was he who became a man who knew no sin that became sin that we be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus it takes both God and man in the union of the flesh of Jesus to deliver us from the power of sin and the power of death he enters into death the purpose he came was to die we know he's God not because of the miracles we know, there was prophets that did miracles we know he's God in the way that he dies. Here's a man at the age of 33. He's healthy. He's vibrant. He's strong. He's full of zeal. His ministry is just getting started. Come on. 20-something years in ministry. He had three years in his earthly ministry. It was just getting started, church. But yet, he submits himself over to the hands of sinful and angry and wrathful and vengeful men. He gives himself willingly over to the over to the. The plot of the Pharisees. He allows Judas, who is on his team, who counts the flipping money, the treasure of the ministry. He knows what's in the heart of Judas. But yet he doesn't shut them down. Why? Because oftentimes, church, we want to get rid of those. That's a thorn in our flesh. Why? Because we don't want resistance. But Jesus would tell Peter, his friend, he would say, I rebuke you, Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter was trying to keep him from the cross. But Judas is his friend, not Satan, because he helps him get to the cross. And oftentimes, it's the very enemy of your life that God is going to use to accelerate you to where you need to go. Ah, Jesus. And oftentimes, it's the kiss of betrayal in your life. It's the person who speaks nice out of one mouth but has another mouth speaking from the rear end that's talking about you in front of other people. It's those people, the thorns in the flesh. It's those rigid, cutting places. Those, those what do you call it? That which is hard to swallow. It's those people that God uses to elevate you. It's there God prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. There and only there you sit down. There in the presence of those who hate you, who despise you. There God shines his face upon you. There God blesses you with the blessings of Abraham. The blessings of the Lord that maketh rich and he has no sorrow. There 
sure he blesses you, but it's in the state of understanding, church, that what you are doing here now is not about you. It's about the ongoing work of Christ. And church, until you're willing to die for him, you will never live for him. You better hear me until you come face to face with your own mortality. Until you come face to face with death itself, you will never be able to live for him. And then once you do that, you can't do it just one time. you got to do it every day. Because Paul said, I die daily. Because you can be willing to die for him one day, and the next day you will find your heart is faint and afraid again. Because we must know him by his Spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever, world without end. Amen. Do you know him in the power of his resurrection? If you do, then you must know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to the image of his death, laying your life down, not just for a friend, but laying your life down for your enemies. This is the God who's calling you out of darkness into light. This is the God who's raising up a generation that will look death in his face and say, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Because the ancient church understood that when they laid their lives down for the gospel, then they truly were born again. You're not hearing what I'm saying? Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius of Antioch, second century, was a phenomenal man of God, preacher, teacher, disciple. And Rome had an issue with him, wouldn't they? Rome seized him and arrested him and led him away to be thrown into the gladiator arena at the Colosseum of Rome. The people who arrested him, obviously, were just doing their job. They didn't have a problem. Matter of fact, it seems to me that there was a lot of Roman soldiers that got converted because of these men who laid their lives down. They're following orders, so they let Ignatius have pen and parchment. So in his journey from Antioch to Rome, he gets to write letters to his disciples, to the followers of Christ that he was being a spiritual father to. And as he wrote these letters, and as he talked to them, he would say something in their eyes, Beloved, my dear ones, do not attempt to stop this from happening to me. He said, for if you, st if you prevent my death, you are preventing my life. He said, for me to die is for me to finally see him and to be born again into his presence. To see death in the mind of the ancient church is to see this world where we live right now as the womb, W-O-M-B, the womb of the brand new creation of God. I make all things new. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a brand new creature or creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Where's the newness of life? It is when we pass from this state of being to the next. And what we have to understand is that God has called us to live a life as if we're already dead. We must live a life as if we've already laid it down. We must live a life as if we've already crossed that final stage, that final frontier, that last place of beyond, and recognize that in the incarnation of God himself, that when Jesus enters into this earth, he makes three descents. Hear me now. Jesus, when he becomes the Son of Man, the Son of God, in the incarnation, when God the Son becomes Jesus in the earth, he makes three descents. The first descent from heaven is into the womb of Mary. The second descent is into the earth after she gives birth to him. And the third descent is in his death when he enters into the heart of the earth. And we got to ask ourselves the question, what heart of what earth is he entering into? Because if you think it's about a geographical location, you are not reading it right. It is in the heart of the fallen man himself. It is in the heart of Adam. It is in the heart of Eve. And every person that was ever born from their offspring, from that day forward to the day Jesus entered into death itself, he is entering into the heart of the earth itself, the heart of you who were created in the image and likeness of God. And God made man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Paul would say then in 1 Corinthians 15 that if this man, Jesus, this man Adam, Adam was made a life-giving soul. The second man, Jesus, was made a life-giving spirit so that in Adam all die, in Christ all shall be made alive. 
Who did you abide in this morning? Because I'm telling you, church, that Jesus is coming to the earth 2,000 years ago. His mission is to get in a fight with death itself. So if we don't recognize this, we don't know how we're saved from sin. We know we're saved from our sin, but we don't quite understand how. And therefore, we're still scared to death. Because we don't recognize that, yes, it's the sacrifice. It's Jesus hanging on the, on the cross. It's the blood shed that redeems us. It's the sanctifying shed blood of the innocent precious blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. But if Jesus did not rise, we would have died with him, but we would have stayed dead with him. Hear what I'm saying? If Jesus would have died and not rose again, he would have died for us as us. We would have died with him. But if he doesn't rise, we don't rise. So you've got to understand that for the entirety of the human condition before Jesus, death legally swallowed the life of every living thing on the planet, every single one of them. Isaiah calls it a veil of death over the entire world. It swallows everything, even in the seasons when, when we find summer turning into fall and the leaves begin to change. We see death already decay at work, but we recognize if we know anything about agriculture that is in the death of the fall and through the winter season, when there seems like there's no hope at all when it seems that all life is gone that the day will come when it will bring forth new shoots new leaves will begin to bud flowers will come again fruit will come again there's hope for a tree according to Job if the tree has been cut down at the root and it has grown dead and dry in the ground but then at the center of rain at the center of water it will bring forth a new shoot it will bloom again you've got to recognize that it's all a pattern the entire world is prophesied the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. This is why Paul would say in Romans 1 that the world that didn't know Jesus is still without excuse because the creation itself testifies of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus, 33 years old at the height of his ministry, submits himself. It is the will of God but it is not the wrath of God against the Son. How can God pour His wrath out on Himself? Give me a break. I'm tired of these lies. It's been propagated. It is not true. It was God in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting our trespasses against us. It was God in Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' hands spread wide. He's going as far as, far as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Death and life, all creation from the beginning of time to the end of time. See the cross. He's reaching through the expanse of the void of the chaos of all things, all things that separate, all things that divide, all things that kill, all things that destroy. He's assuming it in his human body so that at the cross, he takes sin for all men. And it's in his death. See, the religious leaders were looking for a Messiah that would get on a white horse, ride out. They wanted David, Ben Ha David. They wanted somebody who was going to fight like David. They were looking for somebody with a sword and a shield and a horse to free them from the tyranny of Rome. But what they did not understand is Jesus would tell the Jewish people of his time, I have sheep that are not of this fold. He came to fight, he came to war, but not with flesh and blood. He had principalities and powers in mind. He had the devil in mind. And he had the last enemy to be destroyed in mind. His eyes, the moment that Jesus enters into this earth, his eyes are fixed on death. And he will not stop looking at it until he accomplishes what he came to do. He looks into the void. And here's the thing. No man had the victory of this. No man had ever died permanently and come back. Ever. There were some resuscitations in the Old Testament, but they would die again. But this man, he comes into the earth. He does what he's called to do. He reveals the Father to his disciples. He teaches them. He instructs them in the ways of the kingdom of God. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now quit representing my Father, because if the Father doesn't look like me, it's not my Father. And there Jesus is going to the cross, and he is going to enter in to the void of death itself. He's looking into it and he's not afraid for he knows in whom he have believed. 
Psalms 22 is quoted in the New Testament at the cross where Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, this is a song, song of David, I do believe, in Psalms 22. And that song does not end in forsakenness. That song ends in victory. Psalms 23 is the descent. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Psalms 24 is the ascension and the glorification. Read them consecutively. Look at Psalms 22 as the cross. Psalms 23 is the descent. And Psalms 24 is the ascension and enthronement. Jesus comes for the purpose. So here he is at the point of the cross. Death is going to swallow him like death swallowed every other thing, every other person, every other prophet, every other... All that ever existed had been swallowed by death. But the interesting thing, that the only thing God had never known was death, or he is life. And the only way for God to save us is to become us and then deal with death itself. And so as men would enter to the grave before Jesus, they were fearful. They had hope. They were placed, they believed, they, they believed they would go and lay at rest to be put at rest with their fathers, waiting for the day that the Messiah would come and resurrection would be their promise. But when Jesus goes to the cross, it is here in how he dies that he shows himself to be very God of very God. For as death comes to consume him, Christ Jesus our Lord submits himself to the death itself and death swallows him up and in swallowing up the Son of God, that in His death itself, the Son of God, who God Himself cannot die, and because the Son of God did not sin, that when death swallows Him, in death He swallows death up Himself. Jesus descends and in the place of descending into the place of death itself, this time he descends and he takes death and he buries death in death, chains death in death, and rises from the dead with keys of death, hell, and the grave. Yes. Jesus! I'm about to close this out. Give me a moment. i got to read you something. I'm almost there. If I can get a signal. That's why I was talking about technology. I'll leave it be today. I would love to read it to you, but it's just not, it's not connecting. Here we are. Let's see if it'll load in now. Here we go. Thank God. I really want you to see this. It's beautiful, powerful. This isn't a, a catechism. This is um, well. That means it's the teachings that they would teach the church before they would get baptized. You know, so they knew what they're committing to. There was, there was a commitment. There was something you committed to when you, when you come to the church back in the old days. And you know this. And one of the great writers in the catechism would say this. This is about Jesus descending to hell. Are you ready? Today a great silence reigns on earth. A great silence and a great stillness. A great silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh. And He has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He has gone to search for Adam, our first father, as for a lost sheep. He leads to 99 to find the one. 
greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and the shadow of saying that Jesus dies, greatly desiring to visit those that have been captive of hell. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. He has gone to free from sorrow. Adam and his bonds and Eve captive with him. He who is both their God and the son of Eve. This is Jesus talking. I am your God who for your sake have become your son. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead for I am the life of the dead. This is the victory. This is the victory that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jeez, let's pray this morning. I still have a cast in the more court that he used to call one this dark idiot. Que la stola baste te no moja te rediste co te rediste. Como la maste te hoco que está pronto que te ate. Spirit of truth, penetrate into the deepest regions of the hearts of your people and turn the lights on. Ah, la baste te de coste bantiste. Turn Lights on, I pray in the name of Jesus. So all darkness dissipates. So to be freed from the fear of death itself so that we may walk with you in this life, living a life laid down for you so that we may live with you eternally. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. Let it follow us all the days of our lives. This altar is open, church. This altar is open. Jeez. Coming to this altar doesn't necessarily mean you need to get saved. It's, we got to get our mind out. This place is where we come to lay burdens down. This is the place we come to get it set right again. Uh, we need this altar every day. The altar at your home, the altar in your car, wherever you make your altar at, you need the altar. That's the sacrament of the Pentecostal church. We meet with God at the altar. We participate in His life, death, and resurrection at the altar. We lay our lives down at the altar. Jesus, 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 Jesus. 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 Our piano player is not here today, but... We have a guitar player somewhere, don't we? There we go. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all don't want to miss tonight. It's short notice, but my brother Keith's going to be preaching for me tonight. He's a prophetic voice. And he will speak some things that are going to... I believe he'll speak some things that's going to uncover some mysteries in your own heart. And I pray that God uses him powerfully tonight. He is a prophetic voice. I'm not quite sure if you've seen one quite like them yet. Father, I thank you. So you don't want to miss tonight if you can be here. Moving forward. Forgetting those things which are behind. We press toward the mark of the prize. What's the mark of the prize of the high calling? It is taking your cross and following him into the point of no return so that in laying your life down, you are entering into his life. Jesus, we ask you to break forth and break free. Jesus, Jesus. If you need to go this morning, I want you to know you're not under any bondage. You can, you can go. But if you're going to stay, please stay and be respectful of those who's praying. And um, I would encourage you to pray. Right where you're at, where you need to be, whatever you need to do, just pray. Talk to them. A good place to start is when you close your eyes, ask them, Father, make your son real to me. Make your son real to me.
Make your son real to me. Reveal your son in me. In the name of Jesus. I speak this morning, Father. This is the victory. This is the victory. This is the victory. Death is swallowed up in life. Death is swallowed up in life. Death is swallowed up in life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, help me. I feel like somebody needs to hear this today, and it goes with what Shane said. Like this. Oh, Lord. The preacher just said, make Jesus real to me. And I don't know who this is for, but Jesus has not always been real to me. I grew up in a watered-down church, but a seed was planted. I grew up with a storybook head knowledge of Jesus. He was in my head, but he wasn't in my heart. And that's what the preacher's been saying this morning, is he got to know God. And he was always in my head, and I said I believed. And I went to church, but I didn't. I didn't 